it's it's good to be uh, back in Vilnius because uh, uh, actually uh, what we are going to talk about uh, partly started from um, from uh, uh, being in touch with uh, uh, Raimundas Malazauskas that you all know and to be uh, in touch and working with him especially some years ago. Uh, Raimundas invited me in I think 2004 to write a text for uh, one of the many texts for the uh, Baltic Triennial that took place I think in that edition was 2004 or 2005 probably um, and uh, um, at this, in, in the same time, I think 2004, I invited Raimundo to, to make a, a series of interviews for, for, uh, for a publication and a show that I was doing in Italy, uh, which featured uh, Robert Berry, uh, Jan Wilson and uh, uh, Tino Segal, which at the time was an uh, almost unknown uh, artist. Um, so, uh, the text uh, I, I, I wrote um, was probably the beginning at least in words uh, of my interest uh, about certain um, um, certain ideas, certain concepts related to uh, conceptual art, classical conceptual art, but also uh, related to how this concept were going to be translated and revisited uh, by a new generation of artists that was appearing at the beginning of uh, 2000, I would say. Um, and uh, um, also influenced by the, the changes in the technological uh, uh, scenario at the, at the time. Um, so I would say that, uh, that basically uh, there were some topics I was addressing in a very formal, even autobiographical way, which was the concept of the invisibility, the representation of infinity, the, potential, the potentials of imagination, and the idea of, of a form or art as a, as a constant fluid transmission or flux of, of data, of images, uh, without forms, if, if it's possible. And also uh, a, dia a sort of metalinguistic uh, idea, idea that artists deal with art or the history of art. And from there comes uh, also the title of uh, there is no space between off and storytelling, this is a mistake. <laughs> Uh, realize now. Uh, so basically, um, I would say parallel to other uh, to other activities I did, uh, I kept on, let's say, thinking and working uh, about this topic. So in this, that sense, uh, the, that text was kind of important uh, for me. Uh, and also recently, uh, I've been working on shows and texts that still come back a few years after to those uh, topics and uh, some of those artists. Um, the text, uh, maybe is in interesting to say, uh, had different uh, uh, variations, different forms. It was republished uh, other two times, and the, set, the last time was in the, ma the magazine Wavo. Was the last time was the last issue of that magazine, maybe because of, of my text. Um, but um, maybe I'll, I can show. Uh, and was also related to, to a show that I was, uh, was doing with Wavo with uh, magazine in Basel in 2008. Uh, more recently, um, I, I, I curated a show uh, in, uh, in Milan uh, at the French Institute, which was called saint Ver, uh, and also was dealing partly with those issues, or with a new generation of, of artists, especially in France, that deal with the concept of ideas of storytelling uh, and so on. Um, I won't talk so much about that specific French scene because I hope later you will see the performances uh, or the actions. I don't really know what it is of Alex Cecchetti, which is, as the name says, not French, but is very close. He lives in Paris and is very close to the French scene of some artists like Faki Pisano and Benoit Mer, that probably showed here some some years ago, uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, that are, uh, that are uh, French. Um, so I made a bit of advertising for uh, Alex. Uh, you should uh, communicate something about it. 7.30, no, we don't do too much <laughs> advertising. Okay. Um, so these this, this concepts and ideas of, let's say, storytelling, to make it simple, it seems they became quite uh, fashionable in the last few years. Uh, I didn't really take, uh, kept, 
keep track of, of this, but I, I, I for sure bumped into some shows that were called that had storyteller in the in the uh, in the title, for example. Uh, more recently, I think uh, Dieter Rolstad, a Belgian uh, very good critic, wrote a text on Freedom Magazine, which I didn't read, uh, and uh, um, but I, I think it was revolving around similar topics. Uh, sorry for this, this quite long autobiographical um, introduction, but I think it was necessary to just uh, explain why I'm here, what I'm talking about these things, and what is the biggest scenario of this. Uh, I, will, uh, I will mention some artists and will give some information, but I think that in the time of uh, Google and Wikipedia, uh, each of us can make uh, better research uh, than mine. So I will try to keep the information short, otherwise can be uh, much longer than it already is. Um, I would start with, uh, um, um, well, by reading. Um, in uh, 1936, Walter Benjamin published his essay, ah, one thing, sorry. Um, if you don't understand my words or that, uh, please stop me. And if you don't know the artist I'm talking about, raise your voice. I, I, probably you're too polite to do that, but <laughs> the, the more, you know, there will be noise, I understand that I have to give supplementary information. Please help me in, in not annoying you uh, too much, if I don't fall down. So in 1936, uh, uh, Walter Benjamin published his essay, The Storyteller, Reflections on the Work of Nikolai Vesco, in the tiny magazine Orient und Occident. In spite of the magazine's limited number of readers, there were 35 subs subscribers in that magazine. Uh, this is short text, but that's good to know because you can write very good text also for, for a little amount of on people and then this text can stay in the, in the future. The short text has become a reference point for thinking about the status of storytelling. Um, of course, if you read this text more than 70 years uh, after it was written, uh, still has the, I think, poetic and also kind of oral uh, force, uh, oracular uh, uh, quality. But of course there is a number of, let's say, misunderstanding uh, and, and prediction, let's say, that reveal uh, wrong, even from, a, from an incredible uh, uh, writer and thinker as Benjamin. And we will discuss this. Um, so the storyteller identifies certain reasons behind the crisis of narrative art. Benjamin thinks in 36 that storytelling is under a big crisis and, and he, uh, he um, analyzed shortly some of the reasons why this is happening. And these, the reasons are especially the, the falling of the concept of experience. Benjamin was thinking that uh, people that were coming back from the First World War were so shocked by what they saw that they could not really express their memories. So the falling of concept of experience, which the, the transmission of which is the basis of storytelling, the breakdown of social community created by artisanal work, sorry. Uh, so, uh, the socially and economically, the situation is changing, of course. We are in a moment of modernity, industrialization, and, uh, and, uh, and Benjamin observes that, um, that the artisanal work, uh, uh, of course, is, is, is decreasing in popularity, and, and, and let's say that, that, that um, the collective enjoyment and the, the modalities of work of, uh, uh, of artisanal work are the conditions basically for the storytelling because people gather around and they are you know, working together and they tell stories or they sing songs uh, so this is something changed in, the, uh, in that time and, and, uh, and it, for Benjamin is one of the reasons of the fall of popularity of storytelling and, and uh, Last is no other reason is the is the success of modern novel. Uh, so modern novel car um, characterized by the psychological introspection and the also solitary nature of the reading. While uh, the, the, an oral form is uh, heard by many people together in a room like like this, and someone is telling the story, the modern novel is uh, appreciated or is read by a single person reading it. Uh, reading a book and and and, uh, um, and with different kind of 
of, uh, uh, let's say, introspection, psychological introspection. And another reason, the last reason, the spread of journalism and uh, is focused on facts and information. Of course, since uh, Benjamin analysis, uh, decades of technological and social changes has occurred. And, and this is also the reason why uh, the morn of Benjamin seems now a bit update, outdated uh, in the view of the recent revival of interest in storytelling. When I say storytelling, I refer not to the fortunes of the novel or other literary narrative forms, but to the increase in use of storytelling, which is, uh, I think, connected to a revised form of oral transmission, which is, of course, was very important from Benjamin, in a range of segments of society, including those apparently distant from a need for such a narration. For example, politics, marketing, and journalism. So, um, we can briefly observe what and how has changed in this respect from Benjamin times. Um, let's think, for example, about the, the relation between sedentary and nomadic condition. Uh, now we live in a, in a world where we are both, or at least uh, a, a big uh, part of the Western world at least, uh, has the possibility of traveling a lot or we travel through the computer. At the same time we are nomadic, we are, sorry, sedentary, we, are, we sit in front of the computer and we travel uh, through internet or through uh, many other tools. Um, so, uh, and on the other side, we can also observe that blog and web kind of reestablished a certain uh, anonymous and oral condition. There is a uh, big uh, web and community of people that are connected uh, to each other. We can also think about forms of, uh, for example, of televisions that are uh, assumed and are uh, in a kind of state of boredom, in a way, or, uh, which is similar uh, in some sort to the conditions of uh, the transmission of oral forms in a community of people, for example, working together. Uh, on the other side, uh, journalism and, and, and news uh, has certainly revaluated re fiction and narrative possibilities and also their sentimental and emotional uh, potential. Uh, so actually it's, it's quite different from what Benjamin thought, that information were killing any kind of uh, emotion connected to, to information. Um, so we can say that the taste for communicating and persuading by means of stories has not disappeared, as Benjamin predicted, but has shifted, um, it has shifted context and form. Uh, we can also say, and I should say I'm afraid, that this new scenario we are discussing uh, here is also linked, we will discuss it later, is also linked to a general crisis of uh, rational, uh, enlightenment-based thought at the turn of the millennium. Um, and of course, we all know about September 11 and the economic recessions that follow, and also the ideological, the social, the Russian tensions that have accompanied these events. Um, we can also say, to simplify, that reality expressed through rationality and facts that are possible to demonstrate has morphed into increasingly ambiguous tales, where evidence mingles with speculation, conjecture, and emotional engagement. Another reason, of course, is the changes in, in technology and the technological landscape. Uh, it's also played a, a big part in this uh, kind of uh, um, return of uh, storytelling and oral forms. Um, we, you know probably well, for sure better than me, the spread of the internet, the digitalization of the spheres of reality, the potential for art, uh, altering or fabricated images, information and story, and for transmitting this uh, through social networks and file sharing, all these have increased our uh, possibility to spread and to make, to fabricate stories. Uh, as we all know, digitalization makes materials infinite malleable, turning them into form, uh, forms subject to further modification, forms that can constantly change and transmit it. Um, we can say that it is, it is like a, our liquid modernity to use a, a, a the uh, definition, the successful definition uh, of a sociologist like Zygmunt Bauman has taken us back to a pre-modern moment in which stories have a mobile open character because they pass from mouth to ear through a potentially infinite chain of transmissions. So let's think about figures like, the, again, the storytellers or the folk singer that they used to do 
like uh, moving and changing a story or transmitting a story, a song that you from mouth to mouth, from place to place, through the time, through the years. Um, so we can we can uh, say that in uh, um, in, in pre-modern times, the mythical aura was created by the lack of information and the distance between the fact and the receiver. Now it is quite the, the opposite. Too many informations and images and facts to deal with at every moment and everywhere. So somehow the overproduction of images, the overproduction of data and information have also increased a degree of wariness regarding their content. Um, so I, I think we can say that uh, the storytelling, the, the, the fantasy, the imagination uh, in a pre-modern time was created by the lack of information, by the lack of, of witness, and by the lack of uh, images. Uh, so they were transmitted through an oral, uh, in an oral manner. While now uh, the storytelling is um, um, is created by probably the overproduction of images, the overproduction of information of data. Uh, that's why, let's say, the concept of like truth and documentation uh, constantly clash uh, with the huge number of results um, and a result that we can, for example, find uh, in a Google uh, research uh, when we look for a name or, or an information. And also the non-hierarchical nature of the process that connects the material and the sources. Um, which apparently uh, are distant from each other. In the gap of a click, we can connect uh, uh, things, information, names that look uh, completely uh, different and distant to each other. And this is, of course, uh, uh, influenced the way we tell stories, we create narrations and, uh, and stories. Um, so it seems that, that uh, the desire of Benjamin uh, and his mourn of storytelling is, is, now, um, is now back in, uh, in popularity. And all this kind of oral uh, production and transmission seems uh, uh, back um, in fashion, I would say. Um, so we can say that if images and reports of witnesses are viewed with growing suspicions because they are too many or too fluid or too ambiguous, then the yarn, the word of mouth, and even the gossip runs the risk of overshadowing or replacing rational form of source testimony in the attempt to construct some paradigm of truth. Contemporary reality seems to have accelerated the fragmentation and relativizing of our interpretation of the world, which, post uh, which postmodernism had already begun to undermine in pointing to the multiplicity of histories and stories of different uh, vantage points. So let's uh, come uh, maybe uh, briefly with the examples uh, of what is the, in this kind of scenario, what is the relation between, uh, between uh, this scenario, the technological uh, changes of the, this last 10 years, I would say, um, and, uh, and the art, and the artwork, and the, the visual arts. Although probably, uh, as we will see, uh, the word visual is actually put under uh, scrutiny by uh, some of these artists. Um, so, among, among the spheres where storytelling uh, had, had the new popularity, art, uh, um, is, is, art is one of those. Um, and it's something, it's something quite, quite new if we, if, if we think that uh, uh, at least until postmodernism, uh, art avant-garde were um, were uh, producing forms that were kind of silent, they were self um, uh, that didn't didn't have kind of narrative potentiality. Um, so uh, we can um, we can we, what we are discussing here. You will see it's not. Uh, art that deal with, uh, um, with let's say, uh, kind of vernacular or traditional expressions. Uh, let's say the folklore. They're not artists that, that de deal with a certain uh, folk imaginary in a visual way. Or they exist, but it's not really what, what I'm interested in here. But I'm interested more in artists that uh, have this dialogue with forms of oral communication or storytelling 
in the form, in the modalities of production and distribution uh, in this kind of new uh, economic and social and technological scenario. Um, so, to, 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 to uh, summarize very briefly, we can, we can divide the desires into few categories. There are some that discuss the possibility of authorship and the very identity of the, the artist. Say that the borders and the, and the limitations of creativity and what is the space for creativity nowadays in this new scenario. Uh, um, others that tend to reach the limits of the materialization of the object, artists that try to produce a very limited amount of, of matter, I would say, or not even matter. Uh, other that, as we said, reactivated the possibility uh, of narration through a usually discursive practice, as Dieter Olstad defined. Um, and these artists use, for example, and I think uh, um, Alex Chiquet is probably one example, uh, they use formats as lectures or guided tours um, as their own artistic language. Uh, in this scenario, I would focus more on artists that deal with the heritage of uh, classic conceptual art. Uh, so I will uh, not really focus much on the, on the third uh, category. Uh, in, in this sense, uh, conceptual art uh, has provided, uh, has provided uh, some important uh, examples and ideas. Even if we can quote Peter Rothbard, the critic, that say that uh, conceptual art failed in this attempt to redefine art, but it became one of the, of the many uh, possibility for, for visual arts. Uh, nevertheless, uh, um, we can say that still the lesson of, of some conceptual artists uh, was in, important in this scenario. And especially I would, I would mention in this idea of dematerialization uh, in questioning the limits and the invent of authorship and to discuss the question of the, the, the productions of value and distribution of creative work. Uh, and also, uh, as the conceptual art became itself uh, a set of stories, episodes, gestures, uh, thoughts and ideas uh, as a kind of legendary material, a kind of mythical material that some artists use as material for their own practice, like a narrative material, again. Um, as, you, as you probably know, uh, the late 60s and early 70s witnessed the, uh, the, the maximum uh, uh, effort of the visual arts or conceptual art, especially towards the materialization of the object. There is this famous book from Lucy Lippert called Six Years The Dematerialization of the Art Object. Um, and, um, and uh, well, in this book you can find the, you can, you can find the, finishes, the definitions and words from artists that, that uh, summarize this attitude. Uh, Lawrence Wiener, in his statement, said, um, the artist may construct the piece, the piece needs not to be built. Douglas Huber in an interview said that the world is full of objects more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more. Uh, Robert Barry in an interview with Arthur Rose said, I discarded the idea the art is necessarily something to look at. Um, and finally, Sol Levit in his famous sentences on conceptual art say, said, ideas alone can be works of art. They are in a chain of development that may eventually find some form. All ideas need not to be made physical. All these words were from 1969, um, to give you an idea. Uh, but uh, what is probably interesting um, in the view, let's say, artists, curators and critics dealt with that heritage, the conceptual art heritage or some ideas, um, is that uh, uh, first they, they dealt with the, with the heritage in a, a secondary or tertiary way, so not maybe seeing directly works or, or, or meeting the artist or seeing exhibition, but through catalog, through publications, through secondary documentation. And this probably created the kind of nostalgic and romantic aura uh, in front of this material. Um, and in general, I think. Uh, this generation has sort of revaluated or, or discovered a kind of romantic uh, quality 
uh, that conceptual art never um, expected to have. We always see conceptual art as a kind of very clinical, cold, uh, uh, an analytical form of, of art of expression. Uh, this is not true for, for some of the artists uh, uh, of those years, still uh, active, for example, like Robert Berry again and Lawrence Wiener. Um, and we can, we can shortly make an, an example of one of these concepts that, have, that actually conceptual art uh, took from uh, some romantic thought, that from, for example, Friedrich Shelley uh, and early German idealism. Um, the, and, and one is the concept of poiesis, which is a great uh, word, as you know. Um, so, these artists, and together with Schelling, began with the assumption that the creative moment, the poiesis, or the reflection in, uh, on it, uh, rather than the form of the image, it should be the object of art. Uh, so, from another point of view, viewpoint, the poise is the most base and indeterminate degree of art, is art to communicate. It can only be prompted or evolved, hence the attitude of certain conceptual artists who deprive our senses or of the image or of the object, only alluding to it through words. So, um, basically in these works, like some of the works of Robert Berry or, or, or the text pieces of uh, Ian Wilson, oh, oh, sorry, of, uh, of Lawrence Wiener, uh, there is a vocation of an object or, or, or of, a, of an image or of a form, but this is exactly evolved only, it's not there in front of our eyes, but it's somewhere else, and usually it's evolved by words, so words, and here we are, uh, another connection with storytelling is uh, one of the main, uh, the main tool for conceptual artists. Um, for their possibility to evoke poetically or more analytically uh, other images, other possibility, other words. So, uh, conceptual artists reduce the visual uh, aspect to, let's say, increase the possibility of imagination. Um, in the sense, well, here are bad pictures of, of the show I curated in, uh, in, uh, in Italy in 2004 with uh, Jan Wilson, Robert Berry and Dino Sega, uh, the piece before was uh, by Robert Berry, and this is a young Wilson piece from 1968, which is the last, let's say, visual, so to say, piece by, by Wilson, which is this uh, circle on the, on the floor. After that, Wilson started to do only oral communication, meaning a conversation with an audience like this about certain topics, basically change only three, four topics in 40 years. Uh, the topics are time, are uh, um, oral communication, in fact, and the last issue, the last issue he's discussing, I think, from more than 20 years, is the absolute. Uh, the circle is so. Well, I was mentioning I will mention probably on this one later, but uh, it's uh, uh, yeah. We also started with minimal, very minimal works like paintings and uh, sculpture in minimal language. And then he did this piece, which is simply a, a chalk uh, uh, design on the, on the, on the drawn on the floor. And uh, well, of course, it's a minimal form, but probably it can stay also for like a place where people meet, you know, sort of like a, a sign for, for a gathering of people. And Wilson said uh, uh, in the text that he thought after this work that it was more interesting to discuss about this work than to really see it. And then that's why he started to, to, to conceive, first in a very informal way, only discussions. So meeting people in openings or not, or on purpose. He recently had a, a discussion, I think, at the Bacon in New York, uh, to discuss in a kind of Socratic way, like you know, the old philosophy, uh, uh, subject, very abstract and, and philosophical subject, uh, to kind of share Discourse about that. Um, so this is, let's say, yeah, the last, the last example of this, so to say, visual work. Um, this is again a Robert Berry piece that says something about how it is here, like how something and nothing are really uh, massively uh, linked. Um, so. 
I mean, images is just like as a reminder of works that you probably know. This is uh, Lawrence Wiener, and of course, Wiener. These are texts that has kind of poetic quality, but of course, they 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 uh, um, uh, allude to something, to an object, to an action that is happening elsewhere by means uh, of, uh, of language. Um, so we're talking about um, the poesy. Uh, what's happening? What's happening nowadays? How these ideas were translated? Well, this is this is not really about our discourse, but it's probably interesting. This is the first the first show of the group of poem that was considered by poem Musica Vendier Doroni that were showing in 1967 in Paris, and uh, was kind of an action. They were showing painting, but actually was a sort of an action. And it's interesting to think of how it was kind of discursive also this example with a minimal uh, uh, work, but let's say words and discourse were probably more important than the image in itself. Well, you all know Daniel Gouin, and I put here some example of, of gallery gesture, I would say, because this is not another way, like some of these artists, like Gouin, for example, with this show, which took place in, in Milan. 1968 is actually his first social, and uh, and Robert Barry with the famous closed piece gallery. Again, these are examples of of a kind of like erasing of images and to potentiate potentiate uh, the images the the imagination possibilities of the viewer or uh, of the spectator. So, what is after this this wall? What is after? In a, in a slightly different way, this is not really part of the discourse, but I, I like the image very much. This is Garcia La Carnaval in the same years, closing people inside, uh, the viewers inside the gallery. After a while, uh, the, 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 the people got nervous and, and actually break the, the window. It's interesting to see probably this in relation, of course, to this gesture at the same years in, in the Western. This happened, I think, in Tucumán or in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, in any case. It's interesting to see. The, the more direct political, uh, 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 let's say, uh, violence of, of this side of the story than, than let's say, the Western one. Um, so, this is another example, it's very difficult to read, but this is another piece by Robert Berry, which is it's called Invitation Piece. Uh, I don't know if you, some of you know, but one of the shows in those years, in, let's say, the most extreme years of his production, Berry, uh, made a piece that consisted in sending an invitation uh, that one gallery, like for example here Galeria Toselli, was sending uh, an invitation say that it would be uh, a show at Galeria Speone in a certain day, and so on. It was going like in a circle, and I think there was like 12 of these invitations. So the show never took place, but it was like bouncing this invitation. And of course there was also a comment about the artwork, and, and a certain net, economic net of, uh, of galleries as well. But as in the close Peace Gallery, which, is, which was a show that never took place, but was announced only by invitation, say, during the, the exhibition, the gallery will be closed, uh, Barry didn't really produce uh, an artist. So, um, I would like to, to, to come from, from these examples to what how, uh, let's say, uh, younger artists nowadays have reacted to, to these kind of ideas. Um, and, and why? Uh, probably one, one reason is also the overproduction of, of images, the overproduction of data and information that we all dealing with in the, in more and more, uh, year by year, I would say. So, uh, some artists also nowadays uh, kind of deal with that overproduction, trying to uh, to potentiate the possibility uh, um, of imagination, uh, the possibility of what's happening really in your mind. Um, we can also say, as, as a footnote, that it's interesting to think about this uh, possibility in a world where, in a, in a, in a reality where uh, we are increasing, increasingly uh, Monitored. Uh, I mean, our movements and, uh, and the way we, we, we buy things, our modalities of consumption, 
and, um, and, and I quote myself, sorry, from that text, uh, and I said, in a, uh, in a era where everyone is increasingly an actor or extra, overground public performance, monitored, spied on, studied and scanned as a potential threat or as a potential consumer, some artists are suggesting the possibility of an art that exists only in a private place, the still available to us, which is uh, uh, our heads. Um, so basically, our mind has the last possible free space that is, cannot be hopefully scanned or controlled by any technology or any uh, uh, report. Um, so I would just give you a, 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 a a brief map of how I, I see this situation, um, considering artists that, uh, again, works uh, primarily in a, in a narrative dimension, as an oral material, and I think uh, artists like Dino Sega or Chris Bonamichel, for example, or Bonamichel, um, <coughs> artists that, that consider the mental uh, imagery and uh, imaginative, ima imaginative substance, Again, Jason Dodge and Ryan Gander, or other that reflects on the possibility of imagination and the limitations of the visual. Joachim Koster was a Danish artist, Benoit Man and Manuel Monti. Um, so, uh, the, the potentiality of imagination. Uh, uh, is, is carried by um, uh, a young artist, quite young artist, Jason Dodge. I don't know if some of you saw the show here and see it. See some of them? Some of you? No, silent. Um, so I can skip some words. Um, American artist that, that um, makes a very limited use of, of tools and produces very little new. Uh, manner. Sorry. Um, but these are some examples again of Robert Berry piece. This is the gas piece where he left uh, gas in the atmosphere. These are some text piece. You see like from the text how he's evoking, let's say, something unknown, something distant. Um, I'm just putting these examples as a, as a kind of food this is a piece from Alighiero Boetti from 1966 uh, that is uh, called the Lampa de Moir, like animal lamp. This lamp is supposed to light for 11 seconds uh, every year. Today is 11, 11, 11. Uh, so it's, uh, I didn't think about it. But there is uh, actually, uh, I was saying to Gaeda yesterday, that Boetti was going to say that Afghan people got, this probably has to do with the language, have a lot of fun when you say 11 times 11. So today is the day of the Afghans. Uh, for, um, so, but this is another example as the another famous piece, this one of Michelangelo Pistoletto, which is a cube of mirrors facing each other. It's another example of how in the 60s, late 60s, uh, artists were dealing with the poten potentiality of imagination. Because, I mean, what's happening in this cube, we, the only way to see what's happening in this cube is to break the cube. Uh, so it's like a force and an image and a mental image that stays in the, in the form of the cube. And this is the Jonathan Monk version, which is reversing. But, um, well, and of course, this kind of works also provoke a kind of uh, storytelling, a kind of, of, of discourse, a kind of gossip or, or, or legend. Nobody seems ever saw this, this, this light uh, lighting, this light working. But, you know, you go there, you, you wait for it, uh, or... So, in this, in this sense, artists were really good creators of, of mythologies or of expectations. So, Jason Doge, um, this is a piece which is uh, very well linked with, with uh, uh, the one before because what Jason did here is taking away all the uh, source of light from a house in this case I think in, uh, in the Black Forest in Germany uh, and just place it on, on the floor. So 
again, we are uh, forced to imagine how looks that house which is completely dark in the forest or somewhere else in Poland. I think we did different versions of it. I don't know to which place we refer the one we did here. In the village. Okay. So, but here again, I don't know if we should trust the artist <laughs> if, this, if this house is very dark now. Or... I am? Okay. <laughs> um, so, in the case of, 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 of Dodge, uh, these objects he produces are always a kind of carrying of a story. So, we have an object, uh, but the object goes together with the story. Uh, and, uh, and this is something probably that originates from uh, Another very, another very important artist, but more recent, uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, who was probably the first one who started to deal with minimalism, with, with minimalistic forms, but waving these forms with a very emotional, uh, private even, and sometimes dramatic uh, stories. You know, like uh, a group of candies, a pile of candies, are not in, in, his, in his work are not only pile of candies, but they should represent the weight of himself uh, and his lover together, or minus his lover. Or there is always like a, a very personal story behind those minimal forms. And in somehow the work of, of Jason is uh, uh, is similar, although the objects don't really refer to minimalistic uh, language. But Jason again evoked this, this elsewhere this. Very, very distant. Um, uh, so they have a very narrative, a strong narrative, uh, uh, narrative quality. So we can say that if conceptual art historical distance the object or the event to an unreachable elsewhere, evoking only with maps, with uh, with schemes, with instructions, we saw with uh, uh, Lawrence Wiener, for example. Dodge works, uh, Dodge works makes the object the fragile emotional conductor that activates a narrative or an image. Um, so, this is one of the possibilities. Another possibility is, uh, I think, uh, well, still, uh, I think I, will, I, should, I should skip a lot from, from my text because it's getting already late. But uh, just uh, Jonathan Monk is an example of another attitude, someone who deals with the history of art and especially conceptual art as a matter of, a, of, a, of for his own work, as a material for his own work. This is an example. Uh, um, but there are many other examples. He was probably the f one of the first artists in the early 90s to, to, to work in this way, with, a, of course, a, also an ironic way, but with this idea of constant uh, flux of transmissions of, of, of uh, um, and, um, and, uh, um, and he did with, with many uh, other artists and many uh, other works as somehow in, in, in Italian we have this word which is uh, ricreazione, which is similar to recreation in English. Ricreazione is both to do something, to create something the second time uh, or third time, but it's also the moment in school when you are free, when you are, uh, uh, and I think in English recreation is similar. So I, in a way, I think Jonathan Monk are recreations. So it's a moment, it's a playful moment, but it's also an idea of doing and doing it uh, again. Um, so um, another example, more recent of this attitude is uh, from an artist like, uh, like uh, Mario Garcia Torres, he's a Mexican artist, but uh, studying uh, not by chance in LA with Michael Asher, an important conceptual artist. Um, and um, I just give you this example because it's typical. It is one of the early works, the first works of, of, um, of Mario. Uh, and it's based on this Robert Berry piece, which is called the basketball piece, uh, which is typical for this kind of attitude. What, the, uh, what is this work? This work now is only a description of what happened. Berry was asked to submit a project for students in, in the uh, College of Halifax, I think also in 1969. 
And uh, what it is um, uh, sorry, is he asked the, the students to think about a word or an image or a form, but they should have taken for themselves, not revealing to everybody, to, uh, to anyone. If they would reveal the art, the, the art piece was dying, was collapsing. It's like a kind of you know Dracula when he goes to the light and uh, and uh, and he falls all his potentiality. So this idea of secret, of secrecy, of esoteric is probably something that uh, artists of this generation revaluated, that took it from conceptual art, which is supposedly to be very analytical and cold and scientific, uh, and probably goes together with this kind of uh, feeling of uncertainty and feeling of, uh, of lack of trust in, in science or in facts or in the scientific proofs that uh, I think uh, still uh, is characteristic of our uh, years. Um, so um, Mario just uh, made a sort of investigation about what happened to this artwork. What, what, what happened to this artwork? Is it lost? Is it still there? Still existing has been destroyed, uh, and he did. Uh, he went back to Halifax and he met some of the students of that course. He met uh, Askewold and and, re and and did a piece which is a light projection about as a kind of uh, a bit of a crime story in a way, uh, which is another form uh, I think popular for these artists. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, another example is this work that he did on the disappearance of the wagon of Michael Asher uh, but I just, need to just show you an image um, so these are artists that deal with the history of art or the history of conceptual art and use it as an art form, a legend um, another possibility, another issue, of course very urgent these days uh, in, the, in the light of, of technological changes uh, is the um, the one, as we said, about the role of the author, the role of the artist, the limitations of and the, and the borders of uh, creativity nowadays. Um, so, in, 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 our, in our technological scenario, new forms of production, conservation and transmission, and use of images and stories challenge the identity and boundaries of the individual creator. Um, in Maro Maurizio Lazzarato, called Immaterial Labor. Way we produce, uh, uh, the way we products and are distributed and transformed in an increasingly open, unpredictable ways, as part of a uh, potentially, uh, potentially infinite change of transmission and incarnation. Um, and of course, we can we can come back uh, to the famous uh, lecture of uh, Michel Foucault, "What is an Author?" from 1969. Uh, that poses some of this question that is, of course, uh, relevant still now, especially in this new um, situation. Um, so, the lecture of Foucault, by the way, goes parallel with this idea of the materialization that we, we saw, at least in some of the works and in the words that I, that I showed uh, before. Um, so this this uh, um, this attempt of uh, conceptual art to question the role of the author to to decrease the potentiality to decrease the authority of, of the creator of of the artist um, probably reveal reveal himself to be a failure if you see under the perspective of of how important is the market for. The existence of visual art of arts and for the uh, existence of the artists, of the artists themselves. Um, already, Lucy Lippard, in the introduction of her books, of her book that I mentioned before, was pessimistic about uh, about the possibility of conceptual art or to, to reach that uh, that goal, the goal of of uh, let's say killing the author, so to say. Um, but um, and, and of course we can also say that conceptual art, uh, uh, despite the, the will to be spread and distributed more easily than, than uh, let's say traditional art, through also publications, for example, which became 
very important in conceptual art, uh, uh, failed in that because it's probably uh, still is or it was for sure very esoteric, very very uh, elitist uh, um, artistic practice or language. But we can shift a bit the the, 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 the focus and 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 and, and, uh, and quote uh, another art critic, uh, Michael Newman, who recently wrote. Uh, something which I found interesting, uh, pointing out the difference with nowadays and the years of conceptual art in terms of targets or critical uh, objectives. Wherever, wherever, where, sorry. Uh, whereas in conceptual art it was the disappearance of the artwork as object that was an issue, based on a concern to evade reification and commodification, Today, the disappearance of the artwork dispersed into social networks verges on the disappearance of the artist in or herself. So, in the face of this new technological situation, many visual artists have questioned the status of all authors. New digital technologies massively affect the possibility and the limitations of the artist, whose task becomes one of appropriating, packing, producing, post producing, reframing, distributing. In the long chain of incarnation that a form or an image is a story can assume nowadays through manipulation, hybridization, diffusion and distribution, the original gesture of crea creation, the original in commas I would say, of the artist runs the risk to be lost and dispersed in a state of constant flux. And one of the first artists to, to, to in this new situation, to question uh, the role of the artist himself in the technological scenario of nowadays is the American artist Seth Price. Uh, and Seth Price uh, already in 2000, Seth Price worked uh, in, um, in uh, as his own artistic practice, but let's say part of his practice is a publication of uh, and writing of books of publication and a more theoretical activity. Uh, this book that you see, that it has different versions, uh, different covers, is one of the first examples, you're already in 2002, of, uh, of uh, Seth Price's reflection on these issues. What does it mean to be an artist or to be creative nowadays uh, in, uh, in the era of internet, for example. Uh, but other, other books and even uh, a lecture which took form of a video, um, which is called redistribution, which is an open uh, video that, he, that said is constantly changing from 2007, is interesting in this sense. And another, another book, which, uh, is called, which is called How to Disappear in America from 2008, is a very interesting book where he, uh, uh, he, he took, I think, different material from website about how it's possible literally to, uh, to lose his tracks to disappear in the United States. So it looks like a very scientific text uh, with suggestions. You, do, you can do that, you can do that, but of course metaphorically can also be read as, uh, as in a different way related to the, the career of artists, but again deals with the idea of dispersion and distribution in our day scenario. Um, because for, for a set price production, a set price says at the end of this text, um, production is the executory, uh, sorry, executory phase in the process of occupation. Um, together we are running late and the pages are many. What shall we do? We should shorten the text, shorten the text. Like now, physically, just like that. Um, okay, I'll, um, I'll just go to other quick example. Kirsten Peer, German artist. She did an interesting work some years ago called The Letter of an Inventor, reflecting uh, on Edison, on the American inventor. But her reflection was, again, a reflection about creativity and authorship. Because as you probably know, Edison was one of the first inventors to put the copyright on his inventions, basically the ones that thought that intellectual propriety was needed, also for economical reasons. But uh, Kirsten did a very interesting piece, I don't have images here, uh, that started by a letter that she found that was an excuse by Edison that was sending to say that he could not attend a dinner, a private dinner. So, uh, 
Kirsten started to send letters to the Edison estate, or the expert of Edison, say that this asking if this letter could be patented as an invention. It was an invention himself. Or the, of course, it's an ironic comment about also what are the borders of authorships in this sense. Um, no, we're not so late. Um, okay, again, in, in uh, well, this is Ramananda, art, artist from Bratislava. Uh, anyone of you know? This, this was the, the intervention we did in the Czechoslovakian pavilion in Venice. Um, Roman works already from the, middle, the late 90s, uh, probably early 2000. Um, and here are some images of works, but uh, this, for example, is a, is a piece where you mentioned the height of the people who are going into the gallery space. Uh, but maybe in this discourse, what is more interesting are his, own, his performances, which are very subtle. They are basically like situations, and situations is probably the good word if you think about the situationist movement, meaning the interventions, performances uh, of, of the body, or one body or more bodies, in the urban environment. So, uh, as in case, maybe the situationists were probably a bit more violent and aggressive, but in the case of Roman, uh, the interventions are very subtle, are very discreet. There is one guy, for example, that look at the window in a window shop. You don't know if this is, of course, is a work or it's just everyday, everyday life. He looks into questioning uh, what what's, what's there and people questioning uh, what's happening. Or he creates a line of people in a museum. Or he asks a, a, a mother to teach his son to walk, or his daughter to walk in the, in the museum. Um, so they are gestures that are very subtle and they are very uh, on the verge between, uh, between visibility and visibility. And also have a kind of potential form of, of, of narrative, of storytelling, to someone see that action and you know, carry with him these images. Um, another uh, uh, artist in mentioned already Jan Wilson, and Jan Wilson is probably important for this use of a language, for this, this use of, of, of the verbal in nowadays practices, some nowadays practices. And it's probably important for the, for the work of Tino Sega. Tino Sega you all, you all know, probably, uh, and on a, certain, on a certain level he constitutes probably the, uh, uh, the most extreme, if this is extreme. Uh, um, direction in dematerial, dematerializing, dematerializing the artwork. As you probably, as the conceptual artist uh, still had in the case of, uh, of Jan Wilson, we saw, or in the case of many other artists, we still had a leftover, you saw it in this case, in the Robert Berry, or the, in the case of, uh, of Jan Wilson. We still have a certificate or a paper that says something in words. With Tino Segal, we have a complete uh, 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 dematerialization of the object, and only the, the body, the action, remains. Um, I will, the last example uh, is, uh, is about, let's say, another. These are just invitations of, of the Wilson discussion. This is one of, well, as you probably know, Tino Segal doesn't want to have documentation of his own works. But of course, some took pictures. This was a, was a piece in a <laughs> Berlin Vienna. But this I found very nice. It's a, it's a drawing that I, I, I found on the internet. Uh, it's the same piece, but that's the photographic version and the memory version. But of course, what, what Dino does is, is also creating, again, a form of narration and storytelling. Because if you don't have images to witness, if you don't have videos to document, you keep what you saw for yourself and then you tell to your friend and you tell. Uh, I think it was very, when, when Tino did the intervention in Venice by in the German pavilion a few years ago, you probably remember there was this funny ballet of people, of museum guards saying this is so contemporary, contemporary. And I remember walking in the streets in Venice those days, there were people that were singing this tune, kind of rhyme, like childish rhyme, in the, in the streets, like, they were stuck in their mind. And of course, uh, what is interesting
thing I feel in, in, in people like, like Pino, but it goes back to an attitude that we can find in Daniel Buren, is the possibility of being very powerful in a way, be very, even, I wouldn't say violent, but very powerful and imposing, even with a little matter, or a very subtle matter. Because at the end of the day, probably everybody was think, remembering Tino Ryan instead of the big, uh, nicest cultures of, uh, of, what was the German artist? Uh, Thomas Scheibens. Uh, the was next to, the was sharing with me on the, the German pavilion. Um, then, to, to, to conclude before before the conclusions, with an uh, example, these are a couple of examples from from this other possibility of storytelling, which is more related, really, with uh, with real narratives. We are really storytelling with with uh, 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 stories that are told by by people, which are often the artists. Uh, and I think this is quite, uh, it seems quite, there is a group of artists in, in France dealing with these topics. Alex is one of them. Then, but here I would mention uh, Jochen Den, who is a German artist, uh, but lives in, in France since 10 years. And this is some images, these are some images for a show that we did together in, in, in Milan a few months ago, this summer. And Jochen is kind of a crazy teller, really, someone who can speak for like, he did a performance in three parts for one hour and a half, he was constantly talking and, you know, inventing words, stories that of course he prepared, that goes through different fields. <laughs> Sorry, but I noticed yesterday, and, uh, but, no, it's very interesting, I, can't, I, 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 I will write a book about all the mistakes in the Italian language, every day, from the, from the restaurant menus to, there's misspelling, I don't know, I feel, you know, sorry, obliged to, to, to do something about that, because we are already so much in misery and, you know, subject of laugh and provocation that at least don't destroy the language that is something, actually, quite nice that we had. But anyway, this is the Falcon's line, and the Falcon didn't want to go back to the Falcon here actually. So it stayed there for like 10 minutes, it was quite surreal. This is a beautiful image, I think, because you see the old lady walking. <laughs> and, 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 and this is a different kind of storytelling. Apart from the, the reality of, the, of, 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 of Jochen, who never did a cattle, for example, who doesn't really have the documentation of his work, so just his pictures. Uh, um, there is also kind of character really in uh, similar to old folk tales, tales if you think about the falcon here and the chicken and, and the last example of this attitude is of this duo I didn't put any space between words uh, I realize now but, um, is this uh, 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 couple of artists called uh, Louise Hervé well called, these are the names uh, Hervé and Chloe Mellé since uh, almost 10 years, and they they do videos, films. They did recently uh, a radio drama, a radio drama uh, but they do also performances. That, as in the case of, of Tino, they don't have much documentation. They happen every time differently, live in front of people, and there are always stories, um, uh, stories that. Okay, I think Hervé uh, Mellé. Uh, uh, are, I would say, typical of an, another attitude uh, or possibility, linguistic possibility of artists nowadays, which is very much, I think, related to the possibility of, uh, of exploring uh, information and data and archive through Google, for example. Uh, Louis and Claude don't use necessarily Google, but use books, uh, and we can see that. Uh, but, um, but the way I think uh, they deal with information is typical of, of let's say, our, our wandering and traveling in the Google space or internet space, while we go from one website to another, from one story to another, from one information to another, and sometimes, as I said before, the relation between this information, even if they are like one second, one to the other, is very distant. So you jump from one story, one situation to the other. And they, as other artists, I think, are influenced by the way of, of traveling, I would say, and creating narratives through that kind of approach. Um, one only example of, of 
this show that we did in, uh, in Italy, the same one where Jochen was, was a, was a, a, a piece called The Proof of the Tears or something like this. And it was, um, and it was a, a story that they fabricated connecting in a logical sense. Actually, they use only always uh, real facts. But again, as in Google, there's not really uh, a hierarchy in this fact. They can use private things or gossip together with very important historical facts or scientific information. And, and they go together in a kind of a horizontal way. Uh, so in Milan, they did a story which was related to, that which was related with the history of Milan, the culture of the uh, history also of Milan. This is one picture. Uh, and uh, the story that we were combining uh, was revolving around the Standal syndrome. Uh, so it was about Standal, the writer who lived in Milan for a long time, was about uh, the, the, uh, the Santa Ambrogio, the saint, the early bishop of Christianity in Milan, which was assumed that he was very emotional and he was, he was using tears as a kind of uh, tool of communication. Um, uh, and uh, and Dario Accento is a horror uh, director, horror movie director from the 70s, still, still alive, that did a film about the Standard Syndrome. Um, so, um, and this is just a, oh, well, one thing to say is they always dress like this, a, like in a uniform, and they use, as we mentioned before, format of like lecture. They, they, they act sometimes like a like a uh, museum guide uh, that, that, that illustrates your story inside the, inside the museum. Uh, so I would like to conclude uh, this presentation with, let's say, some uh, more than conclusions, like questions. Uh, uh, um, which is um, Questions about, let's say, the, the, the consequences or the possible consequences of this, uh, these attitudes, of the possibility of storytelling nowadays. Also, in, in, in relation to what Benjamin wrote uh, many years ago and how the situation changed from that time. So, um, of course, these are only a few examples, there are more, but uh, but of course, we are still talking about a limited number of artists um, that, that, uh, that work in this manner. So, uh, um, but in common, this artist has the, 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 the idea of, of, of an art that tends towards the verbal instead of the visual. Uh, so, more words than images. Towards the written and the spoken word, in a way, towards literature. Sense, I think Alex Cecchetti is a good example because it's probably one of the more close to the idea of literature, of art that deals with literature. Um, so, an art that tends toward dematerialization on one side, or on the other side, the maximum degree of flexibility, of fluidity. So, forms that are potentially open and can constantly be transmitted as, of course, happens in our files, in our music, in our images, uh, through digitalization. Um, so, in, in doing so, they, 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 they use form of storytelling that sometimes are similar to a fable, to a legend. Uh, and, they, and they use, again, oral communication as a, as a linguistic tool. Uh, while some others, we saw, uh, they don't really work this way, but reflect and discuss and questioning the character the very character of visual art. Some of, some of them really questioning what is visual art nowadays. And the identity and the borders of artists in authorship. Um, I do think that despite the fact that these artists use a very non-technological tools, uh, you can see black and white pictures, slide projector, text, uh, uh, archival presentation performances, they do Deal. They do question the nowadays uh, technological and social scenarios. A scenario where, where technology will uh, even more and more, I think, radically change nature, with capital N, and the nature of images in 
informations and story. In a society where images and narratives are continually and easily reproduced, transmitted and repositioned, and where the original and the copy are, of course, increasingly weak concepts, this artist producer reflects upon an art that challenges the very definition of the visual. Um, so basically, two questions I would, uh, or maybe, th uh, well, two questions uh, arise from, from, from this uh, presentation. One is related to the, again, to the question of, uh, of the author. What is an author nowadays and what are the possibility of artist creativity? Uh, the others are probably the, to go back to Benjamin, uh, is the, the limits, the border of storytelling, but not only the borders in imagination, the creative possibilities of storytelling, but also the, the ethical and the moral borders of, of storytelling nowadays. Uh, so to do this and to finally finish, zip of water. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can go back to two important uh, uh, thinkers that can tell something much better than me. Uh, not really as, a, as an answer, but at least to pose again a question. And the first one in relation uh, to the author is again Michel Foucault and his lecture in 1969. I'm quoting Foucault when he said, How can I reduce? I how can reduce the great barrier, the great danger with which fiction threatens the world? The answer is, one can reduce with the author. The author is the principle of thrift, like the economy, in the proliferation of meaning. So we can say that for Foucault, the author is a protection to the proliferation of fiction and to the unlimited flow of discourses. The author is the principle, according to by which we limit the free composition, decomposition and recomposition of fiction. Again, quoting Foucault, we can say that if we are accustomed on presenting the author as a genius, as a perceptual surging of invention, perpetual surging of invention, it is because in reality we make him function in exactly the opposite fashion. The author is therefore the ideological figure by which we can feel the proliferation of And again, continuing on this, I think, interesting relation between uh, the author and the possibility of fiction, that nowadays this is a question that he posed 40 years ago, and it would be interesting to hear what Foucault might think in this technological scenario, was the possibility of fictional art or creative story are much more, and uh, storytelling or fiction is used, as we said at the beginning, by fields like politics, like uh, economy, like advertising, that usually didn't, or journalism, didn't use, um, use it. So Foucault was saying, saying that I seem to call for a form of culture in which fiction would not be limited by the figure of the author. I would be pure, it would be pure romanticism, however, to imagine a culture in which the fictive world operated in absolute free state, in which fiction would be at the disposal of everyone. All the discourses, the discourses wherever they status, form, value, or whatever the treatment to which they will subject it, would then develop in, anonymity, in the anonymity of a murmur. So, uh, um, uh, the murmur is the way to kill the author. So, not more, uh, 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 murmur is like, you ask about murmur, is again the word of mouth, it's like the, the word that goes from, from Word from mouth to ear, uh, basically. So, and, 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 and famously Foucault uh, 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 concludes saying, who really spoke? What difference does it make who is speaking? Uh, on the other side, on the other side, but to that, uh, another French uh, philosopher, Jacques Rancier, uh, recently, more recently, discussed these issues, although uh, he never mentioned uh, any artists we are discussing here, and probably uh, not even the scenario, really, we, are, we discussed here, but I think his words are really appropriate in, 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 in what we, uh, for our purpose. Um, in the last chapter of his Politics of Aesthetics, uh, which is titled, Is History a Form of Fiction? Question mark. Uh, Rancière, again, is touching this, this very uh, risky and, and slippery terrain between the, the, of the division between stories and histories. 
Um, for MCA, uh, the erasure, the, 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 the destroying of the Aristotelian line between stories and histories, I mean the stories of the poets and the histories of historians, does not mean that everything has become fiction, but rather that writing history and writing stories come under the same regime of truth. So it's not, uh, it's, it's not a question of claiming that history is only made up of stories that we we'll tell ourselves, but that the logic of stories and the ability to act as historical agents go together. So the increasing possibility of, of us becoming us as a citizen, but uh, artist of course, becoming historical agents and storyteller, story storytellers, forces us to take responsibility for the forms, the boundaries and the objectives of our narrations. So basically we are all storytellers and historical agents at the same time. We are all carriers of stories and histories, carriers of narrations. And finally we go back to, to Walter Benjamin that uh, had clear in mind the idea that the storyteller has a very strong moral uh, status and an ethical uh, power. Um, because for, for, for what, what was nostalgic of uh, uh, Benjamin was exactly that uh, potential of, of the storytelling, of the storyteller. Meaning uh, telling a, a story with moral implication. In fact, uh, um, Benjamin concludes the, the, the essay, the short essay, the storyteller, with these words. The storyteller is the figure in which the righteous man encounters himself. And it's actually, this is a footnote, but it's quite interesting to note how in 1936, meaning at the, uh, at the I would say, the peak of the, of, uh, of the already, I mean, uh, 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 Nazism revealed himself, I think, quite clearly in 1936, and Benjamin being, by the way, uh, Jewish, uh, he didn't, in all the essay, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, uh, touch, let's say, the dark side of storytelling, the, 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 the possible ambiguity of the storyteller, not even in front of what was happening. Uh, as you probably know, Benjamin died uh, by esca escaping from, from the Nazis a few years later. Um, so it's interesting because, because even in front of that catastrophe, in front of his eyes, and in front of how uh, Hitler and Goebbels were using, uh, were creating, uh, creating uh, by means of storytelling or fables of mythology, and by use of the radio in the case of Goebbels, uh, 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 their own, uh, you know, their own, uh, uh, they were, you know, gaining attention through basically <coughs> narratives. Well, Benjamin didn't uh, touch, didn't uh, uh, um, reduce the moral stance, the moral possibility of, of the storytelling. But I do think that uh, it's probably interesting uh, nowadays for artists, uh, in a moment where history, politics and art come closer together in their capacity to, to convey stories and fiction, in a moment where politics and history uh, and propaganda use sometimes the same uh, uh, um, the same tools of of art or or narratives, uh, where aesthetic fabrications and mystification become political and social tools. Artists' uh, objective for their uh, narratives might lie not only in the question of authorship, as we discussed, in the question of authority and power, but maybe behind this. Maybe uh, Walter ben Benjamin's assignation of a moral quality to the storyteller as a truth teller may seem a bit anachronistic. Uh, but probably this is a, a goal for artists. Artists that are uh, aesthetical uh, and historical agents, as we all are. Uh, so it might be not only question the limits of the moral and, uh, and the moral ambiguities of their narration. Uh, and but to distinct and separate the use of the storytelling in fiction from the use of other actors as the market, as the economy and the politics. One possibility might lie in the space they create to discuss the political and social consequences of all fabrications even in the art of the storytelling. And I think it's enough. But I'm uh, very open to questions if we have a bit of time.
or internet or something else. <coughs> I use both terms in article and story. How you make a difference between them? How you between? between the narrative and the story? No, I, don't, I wouldn't <laughs> make the, the, the distinction. I would make a distinction between histories and stories. In the, as we mentioned in the, in the distinction that was coming from Aristoteles and also uh, um, Rancière was, was using. So let's say that the, the, the stories of the poets or the the artist and the history of the historians, which are now facing, I think, a kind of ambiguous uh, collision. I would be interested in uh, how artists uh, deal with limitations of, uh, of the artwork. You know, when the artwork is based on language, and, and the artwork is done by other people who they are invite, invited. For example, then you were speaking about this Czechoslovakian artist who invites people like to look for the window and so on. And as I imagine, people just go to the artist and they ask stuff like, what are you doing now? And what is happening? And I'm, I'm just wondering how artists are dealing with that. You know, do they put limitations to the people, what they should talk and what they shouldn't? And because uh, how they create the myth? Mm -hmm. you know, because they spread the myth and do they take responsibility for the myth? How can how they are involved in that? Uh, I think this inter well some of the interventions of Roman I think they happen outside the the gallery space or the museum space. But some of course they deal very much with with the context. So they are in this kind of traditional gesture related to the constant of the institution. Um, I don't know. I think I think they 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 live. They like to leave the the story to be to be told, and the story to be transmitted, and eventually to be changed or maybe to be corrupted. Uh, another example, I think, very very good in this sense. Even if it, we didn't mention, maybe it's too, even to his example is Maurizio Cattelan, because even if he produced objects, he produce now more more sculpturally than. The early days, I think his work is very much re related to the creating of a myth, the storytelling. So he creates situation, he makes some object uh, or he makes some actions, but it's not necessarily the object that is important, but is what this originates. Maybe the early works are more interesting in the sense that the most cultural work of the last few years. But there is, for example, an uh, example of a show he did, I think, in the middle of the 90s. Probably where he was invited in a group show in a, in a castle outside of Turin, and uh, at the day of the opening, he didn't appear, he didn't make a work, but he left uh, a chain of like uh, how do you say sheets, like you, know, you do it traditionally in the prison to escape. So the work was basically him escaping from the from the museum. But in general, and I think in Munster, in school to project many years ago, uh, he was really working closely to the. To the Kind of fairy tale, of dark Gothic folk, uh, uh, folk tale, because he had, a, I think, a puppet uh, <coughs> under the water that looked like a woman, like a woman that was, you know, that was killed in the water. There was nothing else. People were looking at it, and, and again, there was this kind of uh, a story that he, he created. Uh, so I think, in his case, in his case, it was very precise and, and, and uh, caution uh, 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 gesture and idea to, to create an uh, uh, object that reverberates through uh, a word of mouth, a story, and, uh, and even a gossip. Where, and of course this is also related with, the, uh, with a different way to gain popularity by means. So there is also this ambiguity of not really producing something but at the same time making people uh, discuss and talk about your intervention, even probably more than if you just produce a piece. So in this case also there is a sort of ambiguity of it, uh, let's say. But with Roman I think it's, um, it's most of the time about the context of, of 
of the museum. But then I think it, it leaves uh, the things happening. Uh, I don't think it puts limitations. Of